Hey everyone, back here in Austin at Open Source Summit, Linux Foundation. Austin, we have had an amazing day. We spent a lot of time talking about security though and open source supply chain security. We're gonna talk a little bit more about open source. It is the Open Source Summit. I want to introduce you to Mr. Jeff Borek. Uh, Jeff has been, well, I don't want to say how long you've been with IBM, but Jeff's been with IBM a long time. And uh, the last 10 years or so really focused in on IBM and open source software specifically. And, you know, Jeff will tell you this, but I don't want to embarrass him. Historically, IBM has been one of the biggest supporters of open source software in the world, right? Going back to the early days of Linux to many, many other open source, the Eclipse Foundation. Yeah. Great example. Yeah, no, thanks. I, I, when I talk about it, I like to say I stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Yeah. Because back when you know open source was a new thing, the senior leadership team uh, looked into it uh, in great clarity and did some very savvy things. And uh, you know, the triple crown I like to kind of refer to is you know you mentioned Linux, you mentioned uh, Eclipse, but IBM was also fundamental in helping to establish the Apache Foundation. Yes. Wrote some of the bylaws. Absolutely. And so uh, back then, IBM also had a clear understanding that you know this was something that IBM needed to be thoughtful about, not just walk in and say, "Hey, we're from IBM, and you know we." And know I'm here to help. Yeah, or we know what's <laughs> what, right? Do it our way. Um, you know, we uh, tried to go in thoughtfully, both look to how to contribute and establish this new ecosystem, as well as to consume from it in a thoughtful way. Yep. And, and I'm glad you said it that way because it's a two-way street and that people don't understand that. I think today more people understand it, but back in the day, people didn't understand the two-way street of open source software right. and of community. Right, right. Right? For too many people, it was like, it has to be a win-lose situation. What's in it for me? Right. But there's, there's almost a little bit of pay it forward in, when it comes to open source and community. What you do right, it kind of does right by you, and it, and it is that two-way street. Well, it's one of the ways that open source has survived as long as it's had, right? Because thrive. The, the other thing that I think is interesting is that it all started out with individuals. You know, IBM wasn't there at the very beginning. But you had a variety of people that were passionate about it for you know either a possibly a political reason or possibly just an independence reason or some it's almost like for some it was almost like a quasi you know religious yep. type of thing. No, there it was. I, but, I was there for those days. You're right. But then you know the second wave was when traditional IT vendors and it wasn't just IBM. There were others that got in involved early on and started to experiment and see what this could you know deliver, and. The third wave started about you know a little over a decade ago now, but it was you know it led to what I call the the wave of the hyperscalers, right? Some people like to say Fang, but it, you know the Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, all, of, all the, of them, all of the players that built. So I'll these. tell you, Jeff, I, this is how I explain it, and you may agree or disagree. In my mind, that first phase you spoke about. I call the cathedral and bazaar phase, if yep. you remember the book, right? Absolutely, great It was book. very much, you know, free as in freedom. There were some folks who were into open source because it was free as in freedom. There were other folks who were into it because it was free as in beer. Right. Right? And, and it was that, you know, Dr. Richard Stallman and the, that whole thing. The next phase that you described is when commercial software got into it. I call that the big brother phase, where all of a sudden these, these, uh, you know, commercial technology software companies said, wait a second, this is great. We can get other people to contribute to the software we use that we control, that we ultimately own, but we're going to call it open source, right? And we're going to do some good in the community. But at the end of the day, we're going to steer this thing for our own benefit. And if it helps other people, great. But really, we're going to help ourselves a lot. Yeah, I think it'd be. I think I wouldn't that's that big brother. Thing. Well, I wouldn't argue with that, other than to say that different players at scale came at it from different ways. Right, right? and some were more um, focused on what was in it for them. Yeah, that's what I'm trying. Some were a little bit more selfish than others. Right. A at the end of the day, companies are kind of like people, and everyone I like to say acts in their own, own self, self interest at some point. And some people are very altruistic because that's in their own self interest. But some people also realize that 
Sometimes doing the right thing comes, the wheel of karma pays you back in space. Absolutely. And, and that I'd like to think the that foundation phase, though. Right, right. Well, uh, and the foundation phase was always kind of, as big companies got involved, the foundations acted as a counterbalance to maintain a level playing field. Right? Absolutely. Well, I was an Isaac Asimov fan, so I liked the foundation phase. But yeah, it, what it did, it developed this concept of coopetition. Right. Where if we all play together nicely, we will, that rising tide lifts all boats. We start at a really good level, and then what you do with it at IBM versus... Uh, HP right. is, is up to you guys. Well, uh, another great example of that and this level playing field concept is the whole Kubernetes thing. Yeah. Right? People, you know, I'm sure Kubernetes came from a lot of origin stories, right? But one of the ones that I think resonates is the fact that back when, in 2014, I was at a conference like this and all the buzz was about Docker and containers and Uber. In Austin, I and, was too. And, and Docker, to their credit, um, they did a pivot. They Open were working on creating a pass, and they were starting to flame out money-wise. And they looked at, well, we've got a pivot. What can we do? Well, we created this innovation around using containers, and we're going to contribute that out, and then we're going to rebrand ourselves as Docker. And they became the darling of the industry for a period of time. And I was the second chair of the Docker Governance Advisory well, really? Board oh, cool. trying to help them do the right thing. But they made a, uh, I guess, a calculated step that had pluses and minuses. You have the open source project, and then you have the company that's looking to create products. And they conflated that by branding their project Docker and their company Docker. And that was just one of a number of things that created... Well, there was that... Yes. I mean, there's probably a Harvard Business School review in where Docker, you know, went off. Um, well, but but to, to bring it back to Kubernetes and a, that level playing field yep. concept, so the industry was looking for how, okay, you know, that's great, Docker, this is innovative, and it shows a lot of promise. It was great. But the, the bigger problem is how do you do orchestration, orchestration at scale? But they tried to orchestrate. And I'm telling you something. If you or I were in Vegas sitting at the sports book, and you said, okay, here are all of the container orchestration formats. You know, a five to two was Docker, because they had their own orchestration. I, I forget the Swarm. Name. Swarm. Five to two. Um, uh, 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 Rancher Labs had one they would do. That was a long shot. 30 Meso to Mesos. One. Mesos. D2 IQ or whatever the heck it was. I mean, there was all... There was a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Kubernetes was not the favorite. No. It's hard as hell. Yes. It was so hard. Yes. So, but, but yeah. But, but, but what the part of the way I explain its origin story is that it's 2015 now, and you're a CIO, and I'm here to, you know, from IBM, and I'm mm -hmm. saying, hey, you know, um, you know IBM, you love us, um, and, uh, you know, we have a concept of cloud back in that time that was largely focused on private cloud. Yep. And on the other side of the spectrum, there was AWS starting to emerge, and they were all about public. public. And they wouldn't even, they, they threw shade on anything that wasn't them as, oh, that's just the traditional vendor cloud washing. Mm -hmm. But Google would go into that same environment and say, hey, we have GPC. We think it's a better mousetrap. You know, at Google, our propellers spin faster than anybody else's. And we based our container orchestration on the Borg. That's what they refer, refer their to internal. Right. Uh, right. So um, we, we saw you're using AWS. Uh, would you like to try GPC? And the answer back was, well, you know, the, the IBM guy was in there just recently. And I told him I'd never use AWS because it's this murky, highly, you know, not quite sure, but it came through the side door. And now I'm using it, and now I have concerns about it because it's like I got my applications in and I don't know how I'm gonna get them out. Yep, so I'm locked. So even though you know, your GPC story sounds interesting and I'm sure you're smart guys, I'll take a pass for now. And they heard that time and again. And they started to realize, gosh, we need a more open, friendly on-ramp to our board technology. Hey, you hands, handful of smart Googlers, 
come up with an enterprise version of this highly complex infrastructure that we can put out there in open source. And they did. And they came back a year later to that same CIO and said, hey, you know, we heard what you said. Look, we've got this new open source you project. Put it on AWS and, or anywhere you else know, you want. Um, so, you know, so let's talk Turkey. And this, they got some takers, but the smart CIO looked them in the eye and said, you know, you're right. It looks interesting, looks, you know, decent quality, maybe a little complex, and it is open source, but I'll pass. Why? It's a community of one. And what is that? What do you mean? If I do the dance with you and something doesn't go right, you're the only people that really understand, and it's basically a sole source type of thing. They heard that enough, and at that same time, some smart folks from IBM and some others from Red Hat started knocking on Google's door and saying, hey, we see you put this out there. We'd like to contribute and collaborate, but we're not but comfortable not doing it until it becomes under the control of an independent foundation mm -hmm. so that it's a level playing field and a rising tide can lift all boats. There you heard it, the history of Kubernetes, right? And how Linux Foundation came. I'm here. sure there are other versions of No, it. no, I, I'll tell you the truth. I've interviewed Tim Hawken from Google. I don't know if you know Tim. Yeah. He was on the original Google team, Coop team. And um, similar, similar kind of stuff. Yep. But really that is why the foundational model for open source, I think has seen us open source rules, right? And there are plenty of people today gave us this. 90% of all software has open source in it today. Right. Wouldn't be if not but for foundations. Let's talk a little bit about, though, you're here. Impressions. You know, we, we were lucky enough to speak with Jamie Essay, who's also from IBM, and she is the chair of uh, OSSF. But you had a kind of a and I don't mean to embarrass you again. I'm sorry if we're going out of school here. No, it's But you not had a pivotal role in, in IBM's participation in this. Well, the, uh, yeah, the basically being responsible for IBM's open source clearance process, I started losing sleep four or five years ago because I saw this you know, exponential growth in open source. And again, we touched on it. Open source isn't inherently more or less secure. No. But... Um, because of the sheer volume, it created a large attack surface. And I felt that it was time that we really needed to start like addressing this. And as we mentioned, it's, it's a problem that is you know, pretty um, intimidating, frankly, because it it's, didn't happen overnight. No. And it's a huge systemic challenge now in the industry. Mm -hmm. And so you come to conferences like this, two or three years ago and you start sharing concerns and that type of discussion between you know, IBM and Microsoft and other players in the industry led to this issue of helping to kind of create the open SSF, what I kind of call 1.0 because it was right as the pandemic was hitting. And so, hey, great idea and there's clearly a need. Can but, we do it remote? <laughs> yeah, and, and and no one has a checkbook that they're willing to open at that right, time. Because we don't know what's going to happen. Because we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I remember it. So there's been about 18 plus months of, you know, good intent and the, what I sometimes call the good college try. Yeah. But um, it, it was clear that the problem wasn't going away. Well, so I, I as think the fall time that, frame was coming around again, it was time to basically step up and try and do this right. So... Uh, the business unit that I currently work, work in uh, committed the funds. IBM's joined as a top member. A uh, number of big players have joined. And it's going to be... $30 million dollars worth of big players have joined. Yep, yep. And, and it certainly it didn't, it didn't hurt that the, um, the uh, White House issued that... No, that uh, didn't hurt either. Uh, the cybersecurity uh, executive order that went out a little over a year ago now kind of rung the bell with respect to S-bombs and this... Software supply chain security. Right. You know, I've been in security about 25 years. One of the lessons I learned really early on was nothing gets religion to your customers like a good old-fashioned security breach or right. incident. Right. And look, 
and I'm not blaming anyone, but the solar winds thing, certainly, and, and then some of the subsequent ones leading all the way up here to Log 4J. Right. Well, you, it, it was not that long ago, but I guess it was long ago. 2014 is an eternity in the tech cycle, right? Yeah. And that was when Heartbleed hit. Yes, you remember and, and that? Boy, the industry dodged a bullet because a white hat found it. And they quietly got a subset Before of the kernel the bad developers. Guys got their hands on. Right. And they came up with a patch. They got it out there. And, you know, thank goodness the industry largely dodged a bullet. And Linux did not get the black eye it could have had. Absolutely. Go forward three years, and it was 2017. And the Apache community had their own, had their own scare with respect to happen. Apache struts. Yeah. But to their credit, they found their problem. They got the patch. Just not put, everyone put they, it out there so they, quick. Well, they put it out I there. I mean, not everyone applied it so quick. Exactly. Right. And unfortunately, yep. nine, month, nine months after the patch was available. Yeah, I'll go one better. Six months after Equifax, people are still downloading the old version. Yeah. Look, I've been in security a long time. Here's what I... I, I, we, we're running out of time, but here's let me end it on a good note. I think today we are better positioned, better situated, better financed, better organized yes. to deal with this issue than we ever have been in the past by, by a factor of 10 or 100 or more, right? Yeah. We, I, I think we're on to something. And I think this model... Right, so today it's software supply chain security. Two years from now, it might be another thing we're looking at. But this model works. Yep. Right? Because the, the security problems we need to tackle are too big for any company, whether it's IBM or Google or, or Microsoft or any of them. We need this consortium type of... Yeah, it's definitely... Fixing the software security supply chain is going to be a team sport. Yep. And there's one last thought I'd like to leave your viewers with is that that you know we touched on it briefly, but S bomb software bill of materials, they're on the way. They're going to become an acquire, a requirement, but a lot of what customers are hearing is that they need to publish one. But bef long before they need to put one out, what you really need to do is start learning, get your hands dirty, and then use that learning to address those issues you need to remediate. Internally. Uh, before you start, you know, handing them around like trading cards. I agree with you 100%. We got to pull the plug on this one. We got people waiting, but Jeff, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Great conversation. Hey, and many thanks to IBM and all you guys are doing with this. We're going to take a quick break. We've got our friends from JFrog next. 